After the nine months that she carried you and I, we have the audacity to come out now. Mom, you don't, you don't need to change my nappy no more. Mom, you don't need to put me to sleep no more. Mom, I'm a man. I could do what I like. I can go out and come in whenever I like. And this is the reality. Brothers are too busy. And don't lie to yourselves now. I shouldn't lie to myself as well. Brothers are looking to ride out for their brother that's sitting next to them or for the brother that they know from the block and so on and so forth and looking to do five years in prison for them, six years in prison for them, for stabbing someone or carrying a knife and so on and so forth. But wallahi, you're not looking to go down to the shop five minutes for your mother or father. If there isn't enough milk in the house or bread or so on and so forth or groceries, your mom told you, you know what? I still need to do a lot in the house. Can you go to the shop for me? Mm, your pride kicks in. Nah, mom, you know what? I ain't got time. Yes, you do have time. But you choose not to. And brothers are rushing. And I'm not saying this is brothers here. I'm talking about from the communities I've gone to. Wallahi, I know. You could see it. Brothers are neglecting their parents. And you expect happiness. Brothers are fooling around with sisters. And get angry when another brother's fooling around with their sisters. And now, and now, and now you want to be the bad boy and want to go and carry a knife and say, you know what? My man's fooling around with my sister, so I'm going to go and put him in. I'm going to go put a knife in him. I'm going to go put in some work on him. But yeah, you're doing the same thing with another guy's sister, with someone else's daughter. But yeah, whatever goes around comes around, brothers. Do not expect that what you're doing to someone else by ruining their life, what you think is not going to come back to you. How many times do we look in, honestly, and today I looked in the mirror, you know what, I'm going to see some brothers, you know, as a Muslim, we're meant to present ourselves very well. I said, let me do my hair properly, use some argan oil, coconut oil in my hair, you understand? I combed it like a hundred times to make sure I don't like, have none of these little baby hair sticking out. But subhanallah, sometimes I look in the mirror, I'm like, you know what, the reason why the ummah is in the situation it is today is because of the man I'm looking at in the mirror. There's certain sick and twisted sins that we are doing behind closed doors that are affecting the mis- that is affecting the rest of the ummah. And you think, nah, bro, it's the akhid is saying yom qiyamah, bro. The trumpet hasn't been blown where you stand in front of Allah and say, Ya Allah, I did, I did my part. I did, I did what I could. Nah, bro. Yom qiyamah in him right now. Right now, it's you, your family, and the brothers around you. If I told you right now, there's a sister being oppressed right now, outside, getting her face kicked in, her hijab ripped off. Every single one of us want to be a man and go and defend her. Brother, this is happening every single day in the Arab countries, the African countries, the Asian countries. Look at what's happening in China. Our brothers are being oppressed. Our sisters are being raped. And there's nothing we could do about it. But brothers want to be this Hercules and mashallah, they've been watching I don't know too much Bollywood movies where they think they can dodge a bullet. Allahumma barik. Nah, bro. Achi, I've been gunned. Achi, I've been gunned down by bullets. It's a scary thing. On three different occasions, Allah saved my life of being shot at. And subhanAllah, before I went to prison, I was, you know what, I thought I was untouchable. I was doing every, everything under the sun apart from drug dealing. I never touched drugs. And something that feared, that I had fear in my heart is that the brother, there was a brother that mentioned to me, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the du'as of the oppressed. And that got to me. It doesn't necessarily mean Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers the du'as of who? Muslims, but no, the oppressed. You think if a Muslim is oppressing someone that's a non-believer, even though they may not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they followed the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but they are making a dua. They're making the dua saying, you know what, oh Lord, if you're out there, if you're out there, punish the person that's doing this to my child for making them an addict. Punish this person that's making my mother sell my toys, my clothes to feed her addiction. And imagine you stand in front of Allah and every single person that's speaking against you now is the non-believers. How are you going to feel? You're a Muslim. 
Others have lost their have lost what it means to be a Muslim. And you think, oh, you think this fool makes me a Muslim? No, it's a uniform. Everybody sees me, you know what? He's a Muslim, alhamdulillah. But within my heart, beneath this flesh, what's in my heart? What's on my mind? What am I thinking about? Am I thinking about the brothers and sisters abroad that's being oppressed, that's being killed? Oh, wallahi, don't be arrogant now. Don't be arrogant. Wallahi. They're in that situation. We're in that situation now today is because of every single one of us. It's a sin. There's things we are doing behind closed doors. There's things that are we doing to other people that are oppressing them. The drug dealing. Where's the unity? The olders now are using the brothers, the youngsters, to sell drugs for them, to carry a knife for them and so on and so forth, to go down to the country and you know what, bro? You're gonna, bro. You're gonna go to the bando. You're gonna make some money. I'm gonna give you five bills a week. You're happy. Five bills a week is a lot of money, bro. Tax free. You're living good, right? Die upon that stage, bro. I remember there was a brother. He was FaceTiming me. I remember when, he, when I came out of jail. He was FaceTiming me. Yo, bro. I look at this addict. He's like, hey, look at this addict. He's overdosing. I said to him, is he overdosing over your food, like your drugs that you gave him? He goes, yeah, bro. I said to him, let him meet Allah in that state. Because you just killed him. And brother's thinking, nah, man, killing means I have to put a knife on him, I have to pull the trigger. Nah, bro. He's overdosing over your food, over your drugs. And I said to him, Akhi, fear Allah, Akhi. Go and call an ambulance for him or something, man, and keep it moving. Brother did that. Alhamdulillah, the person didn't pass away. But it just goes to show that like, brothers are quick nowadays. Brothers are quick. That if something happens on road, they're quick to take out their phone. Yo, bro, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to go viral for seeing this fight or seeing the stabbing. And they're recording everything. Wallahi, I remember. I remember there was a guy that, so, that people used to make a mockery out of, yeah? Some crackhead. You could call him a crackhead, a drug addict. And I asked some questions about this man. I said to him, what, what made this person go into this state of being an addict, of being the man he is now? They said to me, bro, this is a man. This is from Shepherd's Bush. Yeah? He said to me, this man, he came back home. He witnessed the house fire, his own house fire. He witnessed his wife and two baby daughters being burnt alive. And that turned him crazy. And we're quick to make videos of him. And mashallah, look at this crackhead, bro. Marshall trying to get the views, trying to go viral. But you don't know everyone's uh, you don't know everyone's story. I give you another story. When my wife was in Egypt studying, Subhanallah, she said she, she came across some. She came across a couple, very good couple. They were there for study, and this is in 2011, 2012. They said that Subhanallah. That the couple got into a taxi But the man didn't have enough money on him So he came out to go to the cash machine While his wife remained inside the taxi While he came out to go to the cash machine The taxi drove off With his wife in it He's trying to chase the taxi The taxi's gone now He's looking for the whole day He's looking for the next day And the next day he's gone to the police station He's gone to hospitals He's gone, he's gone everywhere looking for his wife but there's one place he hasn't gone yet. This is in Egypt, you know. Egypt. Muslim country. He decides to go to the morgue where the dead bodies are. He finds his wife with all of her organs missing. And the brother turned crazy. You see, there's certain things in life that we're quick to make a mockery out of. There's trauma behind it. So not every crackhead is a crackhead. Some of them, they turn to other stuff. They turn to drugs to try and make them forget about their struggles and what they're, their, their nightmare that's been playing over and over again with them. So this is a lesson for all of us because this is something I used to do when I was younger. Like, yo, bro, that, look at my man. Make a, uh, making a mockery out of him when in reality, this is a man that struggled. This is a man that's got a, a, a story behind him. And subhanAllah, what upsets me as well within our communities 
is that obviously I don't see a lot of olders here, but there's no unity amongst the uncles. There's no unity amongst the fathers and the older brothers. And I'm sorry if some of the uncles are upset, but I'm going to speak from what I see. I'm not necessarily talking about this community. Allahumma barik, you've got a beautiful community. But I'm talking about there's communities that I go to that sometimes the deen is a bit forced. You're meant to let a person fall in love with the deen. And what I mean by this, uncles are grabbing children's ears like get up and pray your sunnah. With all due respect, bro, you do that to my child, I'm slapping you left, right and center. How dare you? Is this how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi dealt with kids? Why he, 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 he forces Islam onto them? You have to make the deen fall in love with them. And I'm not saying, Wallahi, this is the first time being in this community. Allahumma barik. What I loved about here when I came here, I see everyone salaming each other, whether you know each other or you don't. Now, this is Islam. You see, someone came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and stated, Ya Rasulullah, when two people meet, who should be the first one to give salam? Is it the oldest or the youngest or someone and so forth? Look at the reply of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at the beauty in his reply. He didn't say the youngest should do it to the oldest. He said the one that is closest to Allah. That doesn't necessarily mean you think, mashallah, I salam, my, I salam the imam today. The imam, I'm closer to Allah than him. No, bro. No, bro. It don't work like that. But within your heart, you see, what religion do you know that rewards you for giving salam? What religion do you know that rewards you just for smiling? Something, something as small as smiling. You can't. You bring any nation, any company, any business, any form of government that gets attacked, like the way Muslims or Islam gets attacked, they will all be defeated. But Islam is still growing. Islam is still, Islam is still nourishing. Why? This is the deen of Allah. This is the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You see, every prophet that came before us, they had their own nations. They had their own nations. But the most favored of prophets is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And subhan al-malik, we, we are part of his ummah. While we go to Yawm Qiyam and everyone turns again, uh, turns their back on us, it is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that will vouch for us. You see, this is a man that prayed day in, day out for us. Beast on the battlefield. And shy and humble when it comes to making dua for us. When he used to pray to Allah to the level where he's... He was, he was described that, subhanAllah, that his, his ankles were swollen for how long he used to pray for us. My ummah, my ummah. Brothers, think about yourselves, man. Allah, make a difference within yourselves, man. Whatever that's going on in your lives, give it up. I'm speaking, look, this is, this is, this is um, a reminder to myself. There's a lot I need to change. What well, you think just because I came off the roads and now I'm starting, I'm better than what I was yesterday and I'm better what I was on the roads. Actually, it don't mean trauma hasn't still played up on my mind, bro. It don't mean things I don't think about. It, don't, it still doesn't make me a better husband. Actually, I'm one of the worst of husbands. I say it clearly. Sometimes the jahiliyyah that I used to suffer, that I used to do on the road, it comes back to me now in my marriage. And brothers think, you know what, I can say how it is. I don't care how I look in people's eyes. I'm not the best of servants to Allah. I don't worship or make time for Allah like how he deserves to be worshipped. I'm not the best of a child to my mother or my father. Sometimes, wallahi, sometimes you would think, parents sometimes, they, they get divorced. Wallahi, they get divorced. Not because of their problems that they, they, they might have, but because of the kids. The kids are causing so much problems out on road and stabbing people and selling drugs and bringing the money back and mother is changing the bedding and finding drugs underneath their beds and thinking to herself, that's not a child I raised. 
And then she throws it away. So now the child goes, are you mad? To your mother. Are you stupid, mum? I know people that's pushed their mothers out of the way. Dashed them around. Why? Because their mothers found drugs in their, in their house. A Muslim household. Threw it in the bin or flushed it down the toilet and they're going mad at their mothers. Brother, I'm telling you now, if you want to live this bad boy lifestyle that you're, that you're seeing out on road or you're seeing out that all of these fake rappers that are doing, the fast cars, the girls, the money that they're flashing out in, in their music videos, I can tell you this. Wallahi, none of them is happy. Why do you think majority of the people that commit suicide are rich people? Think about it, brothers. Majority of people that are committing suicide are rich people. People that Allah gave them wealth. They're overdosing. Rappers are being called lacking without their security and getting shot up because of their name. Things are happening. And us brothers, like a waste man, especially me, thought I could be one of these men. Yo, let me start carrying a knife. Let me start carrying a gun. Let me start drug dealing. Let me start turning a man's face open to get that ratings, to get that status I want in my community. It doesn't work like that. You see Tupac? Everyone knows who Tupac is, right? Fuck life, yeah? Everyone knows who that is, yeah? <laughs> Look what happened to him. You know, Tupac got a post to do a, a movie. A movie, yeah? And this is an interview you could find on YouTube. He got a post to do a movie. And you think to yourself, hold on, what role did he... He said, we'll give you money. Quite a lot of money as well, yeah? So we'll give you money, yeah? To play a Muslim gangster. <laughs> he laughed. Why are you laughing? It's, a good, like, it's good money. This is Tupac, not even Muslim. Wallahu a'lam, for my knowledge. He said, why do you want me to play a Muslim gangster? They're like, it's to play a movie role, a Muslim gangster. He said, there's no such thing as a Muslim gangster. So I'm not going to be fake. This is, this is a man, fuck life, gunshots, music videos with women and money and shootouts. This is a man that's telling us that there's no gangsters in Islam. But yet we wanted to be like him. Yet we wanted to live this fuck life. Wallahi, name me one gangster that's a Muslim. True gangster. I'm going to tell you who the true gangster is. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he himself talks about in the Quran. Fir'aun. You know Fir'aun? This is a man that thought he was a God himself. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Fir'aun was the biggest gangster that ever set foot on earth. Look what happened to him. And you'd think for us as Muslims, we want to go down that path and really do something and make a difference of ourselves. I told you this, brothers, though. The brothers that have thought about it, maybe we're at our age, we're confused. Anywhere between, what, 17 to 22, 23, we're at that confused age where we're trying to find ourselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, yeah? He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa la taquluna ka alladheena nasallahi fa'ansa'am anfusahum. Do not be like those that forgot Allah. For indeed Allah made them forget themselves. How many of us forgot ourselves? And you may, you may think, bro, how do I forget about myself? <laughs> you smoking weed? Yeah, you forgot about yourself, bro. You missing salah? You forgot about yourself, bro. You drinking alcohol? You forgot about yourself, bro. Why? The body has rights over you. So now, your pa this dunya has become your paradise. The hadith says this dunya is like a paradise to the non-believers. Why are we acting like non-believers? Wallahi, the moment you make your akhirah, your priority, uqsumu billah, this dunya will chase you, brothers. You see this madrasa or Quran and being good to your parents. You see your parents are getting old, man. You could see them having grey hairs. You know, you see your mother. Now at home, she's taking off her hijab. You're like, wow, you're looking at your mum like, Wow, man, her wrinkles are really coming through now. Appreciate your parents. Appreciate what they've done for you. 
And wallah, I remember days where I used to come home, I think to myself, oh, here we go, mum, why are you still awake? Now looking back at it, it hurts me. Like this is the mother that I used to see come. This is the mother that I used to see come to the hospital while my brothers got stabbed up. My mother's coming to the hospital, bro. And she's sitting on the floor. And she's crying her eyes out. She's making dua. Ya Allah, give my son another chance. Ya Allah, allow him to be still living. Ya Allah, do not take this son away from me. This is, this is, this is my mother. This is your auntie. Our mother. Do you think it's fair that your mother has to bury her child? Wallahi, I went to three funerals in the space of, what, two weeks. Brothers that I knew. Good brothers. Brothers that left their legacy. It wasn't bad. One was a student of knowledge. The other ones was just studying, coming to the medrasa, learning. That's what he was doing. Brother, let me tell you something about me, yeah? And this is something not to brag, this is not nothing. I was making a lot of money on road. Alhamdulillah. I'm not saying Alhamdulillah to that, I'm saying Alhamdulillah. Like, I'm here to tell the story, you understand? I was making a lot of money on road, bro. That, but that money never brought me happiness. And it got to a stage where I was, Akhi, bro, I was unstoppable, I was undefeated, bro, get me a man, I don't care how tall he was, bro, he could have a six pack on the back of his head or jaw, I don't care, I'm taking my man down, Allah bless him with the opportunity to know how to fight, so me, I knew how to fight, I don't care, I'm just a little skinny guy, bro, but put the biggest guy in front of me, well, alhamdulillah, that was, that was my ability, that's how my name grew in my area, but subhanAllah, Allah slowed me down, Oh, my servant, you're getting a bit ahead of yourself. So do you know what Allah done to me? Allah put me in prison. So I, so I went to prison in 2012. Throughout my whole sentence, there was good times. When I mean good times, I mean, like, subhanAllah, like, I really got closer to Allah. Reading books, learning the deen, reading about a lot of companions and their life and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like I fell in love with the deen all over again. And sometimes I would read a book over and over again. Because I, I had a long sentence. So sometimes I would read the book over and over again. And sometimes you, I, like my understanding would get better. And I would learn something new. But when I, came, but when I was in prison, I'm going to tell you about the day where I went to prison. The day I went to prison, my mother saw four of her kids leaving the house that day. None of us returned. Me, my older brother, and two of my younger brothers. We left that house that morning. None of us returned. I knew I was going to prison. I packed my bag, kissed my mom. Mom, I'll see you when I see you because I'm getting sentenced. I was on tag as well. So I went there. I got sentenced. I, my brothers came back to the area. Both of my brothers ended up getting stabbed the same day I went to prison. And both of them got arrested for attempted murder because they shot someone as well. My older brother came back from work. He saw the commotion. He saw my brothers being stabbed. I'm in jail. Saw my brothers being stabbed. What did he do? Made a U-turn, put my brothers in the car, took them to hospital. While they're on their deathbed, they got handcuffs on them and they've been arrested on suspicions of attempted murder because they shot someone. And that person that they shot is fighting for their life. Is it fair for my mother to see four of her kids looking healthy, looking good, leaving that house that day and none of us returning? My older brother got arrested for what? For being a getaway driver, they said. He proved that he would, just came back from work and they dropped the case on him. Then both of my brothers ended up getting sentenced. So my mother now has got three kids in prison. And each one of us is in a different prison. You think it's fair for our mothers to come to our prison, visits, and has to go. Listen to this, yeah? This is, this is our mothers, you know, that cover themselves in Abaya and so on and Jirbab. That cover themselves from head to toe. This is our mothers that 
you see from a distance, you see that it's exactly like this. Like, imagine this is a visiting hall inside the prison. Everyone's got a table and so on and so forth. You see your mother coming in and your mother's doing this. And they're searching her to see if she's bringing anything in for her son. You think it's fair for our mothers to come to prison visit? So imagine if we do something stupid and you end up killing someone and you're doing life in jail. Do you want your mother for the rest of her life to come to prison like this and being searched and having certain parts of her body touched? Certain parts of her body touched and guess what? Having dogs sniff her up, making sure she don't have drugs. Do you know how embarrassing that is? I saw that, I said, mom, don't ever come and visit me again. I'd rather just call you. She came to visit me. In two years, she came and visited me once. I was too embarrassed to show my mom this. But, but I made an oath. I said to my mom and dad, mom, when I come out on the road, I'm going to be a different man. I'm not going to be this sick and twisted man that you remember, that always used to come home. I got you know, blood on my fist and blood on my jumpers and this and that and oh I'm hurt. I'm gonna be different inshallah. I'm gonna I'm gonna make you proud mom. I'm gonna make you proud dad. I came at a Joe. The first time I got stabbed was in the leg at a train station. Imagine in Joe, I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. You know when you have a fight in Joe, they take your TV away and you go into isolation for like three weeks. So you get no TV for three weeks. You don't associate yourself with no other prisoners for three weeks. You get a shower one every few days. And that's the situation in prison. Majority of my sentence, I, had, I didn't have a TV, so it was good for me. TV was a distraction. So whenever I got a chance, stuff flies in. I had a fight. TV got taken away. The book's open. Book's open. I'm focusing on Islam. Um, but I went to three different prisons in one sentence. First Joe got kicked out because I was too violent. So they kicked me out from a Joe outside London, just, just on the outskirts of London, all the way to Leicester. Wow, they shook me. They, they took me far. Leicester, you know. Man was in Leicester. I'm like one of the only London guys there. So everybody's trying to be a bad boy now. Everybody's like, oh, look at this London. I'm trying to pick and knit and this and that. And obviously I'm there to defend myself. And I did what every man would do would defend himself. Then on top of that, they shipped me out to a, a prison in London, in South East London, called ISIS. What a name. What a name. HMP ISIS, yeah, to clarify, yeah. I don't know if there's any listening devices here. So, some undercovers here, maybe. You know, no, I'm joking. But um, there was, it was HMP ISIS. So I got to ISIS now. And when I got to ISIS, bear in mind, I came across a couple guys that actually stabbed my brother in there. So this was my opportunity to get to them and this and this and that because on road, mashallah, they're road runners. But here now, this is my opportunity. But that prison that I was in, the last prison I was in, yeah, in my whole sentence, I was in there for 14 months. Not once did I go to Jum'ah because I even had brothers beefing me that I didn't even know. Brothers were randomly punching me in my face while I'm going to education or I'm going to the gym or I'm going to... Randomly, I'm walking and you get punched in the face. And I'm like, Lord, let me just... Who the hell is this guy? Inshallah, they call him a nickname of bullet. Yeah, I wonder why, man. Shit head. <laughs> Mad. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Ridiculous names. I, I, I know now. I, I know why they call you bullet. But yeah, bro, listen. Randomly, you know why? Because they made friends with my enemies before I came to that jail. So now everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. Randomly getting punched and randomly getting into fist fights with people and at times, I remember there was a time I was fighting like, I think like 11 men. And when I was fighting them, subhanAllah, not even a drop of blood. But when I got back to my cell now, all of, all of my jumper was ripped up because they was trying to stab me. One, I don't, obviously, they brought a knife into prison through a gov and so on and so forth. They had a flick out. But my jumpers and my t-shirt, my, I'm sorry, my vest underneath was all ripped up. And I'm panicking, thinking, bro, that did they stab me? No, alhamdulillah, Allah protected me. So they pierced through my jumper, through my vest, but not my skin. So Allah just had me. Alhamdulillah, defended myself very well. This is because they jumped, they ran up on my block, 
where I was living at the time, mashallah, tax free. But they did what they needed to do. And when I came out, Joe, like I said to you, in prison, I never looked after myself because at times they never gave me toothbrush and this and that. So at times, I was just brushing my teeth with my fingers, you know, like that. Like using hot water and just, you know what I'm saying? Man didn't even have a maswak. I wanted to go for a walk and just chop a branch off to use it as a maswak, but you couldn't. So, so when I came out of jail, I said, the first thing I need to do, subhanAllah, is I need to go to the dentist. I got to the train station. MashaAllah, I got to the train station. On the opposite platform, a train pulls up. A train pulls up. Now I see a guy, subhanAllah, broke his jaw before I went to prison. But he's with two other guys. So this guy is coming onto my side, but bear in mind, I found out that he became a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, I was happy. Yeah, I didn't know thinking if there's anything's gonna pop off. The guy comes onto my side of the train. He sees me. Salaamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. I'm giving him hugs, everything's cool. Next thing you know, while my train's pulling up, he's leaving the train station. It was him and two other guys. I see him taking out through a little fence, like a little gap. Like there, like this, this gap, like, but from a distance, I see him taking out a knife, yeah. Sorry, I feel like I'm going to sneeze. For a little gap, I see him taking out a knife. And he gave it to one of his youngers. His youngers came back on the train. While I'm helping out a lady, um, while I'm helping out a lady with her buggy to get on the train, yeah, he swan from me. But subhanAllah, yeah, I'm helping the lady. Like, it's one of them overground trains, so they're a bit higher than the platform. So while I'm helping the lady with her buggy, I tripped. As I tripped, he, he tried to stab me. So me falling made him miss me. So he's gone to try and stab me now. SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, he missed me. I've turned around now. My guy's just trying to stab me, stab me, and I'm trying to kick him away. I'm trying to just go to my dentist appointment. I've got a hole in my tooth. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to keep him away. I'm trying to shut the door. He's opening, shutting, opening, this and that. So I kicked him with my left leg in his chest. As he's falling back now, he's holding the knife like this, so the blade is here. He just going boom. He stabbed me in my leg on the side of my kneecaps. And my kneecap was the one that stopped it. So my kneecap actually stopped the stab from going any further because it's, 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 it's the inner kneecap. I read it Yeah? Thank God it didn't go through. So he stopped it. My man's running away saying, yes. Well done, mashallah. My man's running away excited. I must have been his first knife victim, mashallah. Well done. <laughs> He's run away But this is the reality of things The guys, I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't got an issue with the guy But this brother That I thought was Muslim Decided to take out a knife Give it to a non-believer To shed his brother's blood And on, and on this I remember There was a brother I used to speak to Obviously I don't speak to him no more for whatever personal reasons yeah. But I remember at the time when I was speaking to him I was giving a talk I was giving a talk in a school in East London. So I was going straight to Wembley to go and meet him. SubhanAllah, this brother, from what I remember, he cared a lot about his own brother. He cared a lot about his blood brother. He cared a lot. So he tried to get a project because we was in construction. We tried to get a project. And this project, he wanted his brother to do it. But his brother, the shaitan, got to him. The shaitan started whispering certain things in his ear and so on and so forth. And he tried to... What happened? When we pulled up to the house, he actually stabbed his brother twice in the back. Muslim brothers, blood, same mum, same dad. Blood brothers. This is what it's come down to, man. Brothers are stabbing each other and hurting each other. Brothers that share the same mum, the same milk that they were feeding from. are now stabbing each other over the desires of this dunya. Allah, he stabbed him twice, I think twice, twice or three times in the back. And I just came from a school giving a talk about knife crime. What is going on in our communities, man? I know another story of two cousins, both ballied, both ballied, yeah? Ballied up, doing whatever they're doing. They go out there, they're riding out on one another. They don't know that they're cousins. They do know they're cousins, but because they're both covered up, they don't know who they're stabbing. They both ended up stabbing each other. Cousins. Your auntie, I mean your mother, is the sister of my mother. 
cousins. This is called Muslims. So they ended up running away after stabbing each other, but both of them. When he got to the hospital, he one of them pretended, one of them pretended that he got stabbed somewhere else, so he doesn't link to this stabbing if this stabbing comes to the hospital. While he's laying in the hospital, he's laying down, he sees the guy wearing the same clothes that he stabbed up. He's coming. They're doing, they're doing CPR. They're trying to give, uh, keep him awake. When they took off the balakava now, the bali that he was wearing, the guy that was stabbed him is looking at him and goes, and just broke, just breaks down into tears. His cousin's passed away now, and the one that stabbed him is looking at him saying, oh my days, I just, I just killed my own cousin. And I didn't know it was him because he was covered up. This is the reality. And you would think that the Ummah is going to be in a good place? No, bro. It don't work like that. Even though I knew the guy that stabbed me, I knew where he So forth, I left it to Allah because I made the oath to my parents. I'm not going to go back to that life. As time went on, I ended up going to work on my first day at work as a construction worker. First day at work. My parents were very happy for me. All the boys just came back from Barbados. I don't know what he was doing in Barbados. I've all the country. As I said, came back. I'm talking to him, bro. I'm talking, I was talking to him on Tuesday evening because he came back on Tuesday. Bro, I'm working tomorrow. He's like, I'm happy for you. And my mother's And um, subhanAllah, bear in mind, my other brothers are in jail. So I to just do something, make a difference for my life. I went to work the next day. It was a work. Went to work. I came back to the area. I came back to the area. Guess what happens? I don't know where it is for people being stabbed outside chicken shop. Wallahi. Them man there love their chicken, innit? Wallahi. So imagine I went to the masjid, came back to the area of pollution, went to the masjid. I went to pray after. On my way towards the chicken shop, I see one black you. I see one black boy. Bear in mind, all of my friends are black. My eyesight is very bad. I've got short sight and long sight. When I'm trying to focus on finding out who this guy is from on site. Community, but I see this black guy, he's kind of moving a bit dodgy, like he's like he's agitated, like he's waiting for something. So I was with a brother, I said to the brother that's with me, it's a bro, walk in front of me and act like you don't know me. So if this is a pagan, if this is an enemy, I'm gonna deal with him. He said, All right, say no more. The brother walks, the brother spuds him. When the brother spuds him, I got comfortable, thinking if he knows him, I know him. As I got closer to him, the brother spuds him. I see him, it's a guy I went to school with. How you doing, man? How you been? I'm wearing my high top. I mean, high vis, my hard hat, my construction combat trousers, everything. Like I'm, I'm first day at work, Achim, man. I'm walking around my area, even though I've got enemies. I'm walking around my area, Achim, man. Angels are protecting me. Everything's calm. I'm cool. Like I forgot I had enemies because I was so excited. I'm, I'm working now. As soon as I turn around, so I'm talking to him like this. Everything's cool, hugging each other, this and that. As soon as I, so this is him. As soon as I did this, so not even like fully turned around. As soon as I did this, he stabs me right here on the side of my bum cheek, and the knife comes out here. So the knife actually comes out. But I didn't know he stabbed me. I thought he just gave me a punch because it felt like a punch when I got stabbed. So I've turned around now. I'm trying to fire him, but I'm weak. Like my left leg, where all the power comes, is weak. So I'm I'm trying to fight him, but I'm 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 just feeling weak, and I feel like hot boiling water running down my leg. I'm like, wow, did this? Did he just threw hot water on me? But no, it's just the blood. The blood when it comes out of the body, it's very hot. So I'm like, oh, and I I realized I've been stabbed. So I took off my hard hat. I threw it at him. It just lands there. There's no power in it. As soon as my hard hat dropped, yeah, my friend that was with me kind of froze. I'm not saying he's a waste man. I'm not a long bad, a very, very good brother. But the brother that was with me, he's just like, what just happened? So I've run into the chicken shop now and I said, yo, boss man, I've been stabbed, called the ambulance. As soon as I said that, I collapsed on the door. So I'm, half of my body's inside the chicken shop, half of my body's outside the chicken shop. 
And I remember the police came within a few minutes. Like, they knew who I was. They know me from the community. So the police are not stupid. They're like, oh, hello. You all right? What's your name? La ilaha illallah. Do you know where you are? La ilaha illallah. Like, I, I, wanted, I wanted la ilaha illallah to be my last words. Just because I wanted to die upon these words, yeah? If I were to die, it doesn't mean that, mashallah, the gates of Jannah is going to open for me like them automatic Tesco doors. Nah, bro, it don't work like that. I'm still going to go through my trials. I'm still going to be going through my questions. And inshallah, I don't go to Jahannam. But if Allah doesn't forgive me for certain sins, I'm still going to do my time in Jahannam. And nobody wants to do that. So imagine the guy runs away. Mashallah, we got another yes man. Run away, yes. He kept it moving. Ambulance comes. I get into the ambulance. I get to the hospital. As soon as I got to the hospital, my heart stops. Now, they're fighting for my life. They're using their fibrillators to try and bring me back. Everything. They're doing CPR. They got one doing an oxygen mask. Everything. <laughs> then they take me into the theater room. They take me into the theater room and subhanallah. Yeah? The man that was operating on me was an atheist. A person that believes in, he doesn't believe in Allah. He doesn't believe in any God. He's just a man that goes with the wind, as they say. Like, he just, he believes in himself. Like, bro, there's no such thing as Yom Qiyamah, Day of Judgment, and so on and so forth. <sighs> so he said, while we pronounce the dead, and we put the sheet over your head, that like we actually put the sheet over your head, we looked at the time, time of death, we wrote it down. Yep, yep. Amen has passed away. And then the doctor said we was discussing amongst ourselves as who's going to be the person to go and inform my family and friends that have passed away. You see, I still had a machine attached to me to tell me if I got a heart monitor, like if there's a heartbeat. So, but on that machine, it just goes, Dee. so there's no heartbeat. He said, we gave up on you, Amen. He said, just as I was about to leave the surgery room to go and inform your family and friends, your heartbeat came back. He said to me, Amen, in my all professional years of being a surgeon, I've never, see, I've never seen this. This is him narrating it to me. And he was like to me, he was like to me, rush back. And we operated on you for 18 hours. And I said to him, why 18 hours? He said, Amen, how you got stabbed? He went through your intestines, your blood vessels, everything you can mention. He damaged me pretty bad. He said, your feces, your poo, was basically open, but in surrounding every organ. So we had to basically clean out your heart, any poo that was around your heart, your liver, your lungs, this kidney, this. They cleaned out my whole body. Then they did what they needed to do. Until today, I suffer from nerve damage on the left side of my body, which results in... Me being in pain 24-7. 24-7 I'm in pain. Even now when I'm speaking to you. Some days is bad. Some days is doable. Like today is okay. Some days I don't even wear a sock. That's how bad it is. So when I'm sleeping with a blanket. Oh, I can't even put a blanket on the left side of my body. Because it's so painful. I've got the sensitive side of the nerve damage. Not the numbness. I've got the sensitive. So imagine. <sighs> then I woke up with something on my stomach. I think to myself, what the hell is this? I said, yo, call the doctor back, man. He forgot something on my stomach. Nah, wallah, he forgot something on my stomach. What the hell is this? It was alien to me, bro. It was nothing I've never seen. So when I got stabbed, yeah? I'll show you, I'm wearing, I'm wearing my shoes from inside the house, yeah? So don't... I woke up with this. So this is the bag that I have on my stomach. So this is... This is a bag that basically means that you can't go for a number two. So you're, so nothing comes out of my back passage. Everything comes out into this bag. And what happens while everything comes out into this bag, I change it maybe once, sometimes twice, if I eat a lot, three times a day. Like, this is, this is what I suffer from. And sometimes, and I'm saying this to you as a man, yeah? It's a blessing having this bag.
but I hate having this back. And sometimes I get emotional because at times when, say for instance, if I'm out, my bag would leak. I basically got poo running down my leg and it's embarrassing. I don't want to jump in anyone's car. I don't want to jump on transport because people might smell it. And this is what gets to me a lot. And I've been living with this since 2014. And it hurts me, but at the same time I say, you know what? My heart stopped for three minutes, over three minutes. And Allah brought me back. And there was a sister, I remember there was a sister that said, he said, Amen, when I came back to Lucian Masjid, because I got stabbed not far from Lucian Masjid, she said, Amen, I just came back from witnessing my brother's body. Her brother was a Muslim, but she was a revert sister. She said, I just came back from the morgue. I had to witness my brother's body. And I just found out that there was another person that got stabbed. I just didn't know that person was you. Outside Chick Chicken. And she said, Wallahi. She said, Wallahi. Four people died in my area. Stuff like four people got stabbed in my area. And you was one of them. Like in our borough, at that, in that week. <laughs> she said, every single one of them died but you. It just goes to show, brothers, man. You see, even if we, when we lose hope, and at times we think, you know what? Why am I suffering? Why am I? Why is these things happening to us? But you know all of these suffering, these trials that Allah's putting us through, yeah? It's to put us back on that path. It's, put, it's to put us back on that, on that remembering Allah. To not forget ourselves. Because wallahi, I've done a lot of evil things in my life. And when I got stabbed, I thought, you know what, this is the end for me. But Allah kept me alive and I'm like, why? After everything and every family that I hurt and every scumbag that I, that I put in their place and someone and every God knows whatever crimes that I've done. I'm not going to expose them. Why are you keeping me alive? Why is it that you're choosing me and the three other people that got stabbed in my area the same week as me is dead but me? But Allah chose for you to wake up today like he chose for me to wake up today. You see, some people go to sleep every single night and they don't wake up the next day. Some of our brothers and sisters are in our countries back home, they go to sleep and next thing you know, they're waking up in the grave, man. They're waking up and they're being questioned. This is the reality. Because a bomb is dropped on their house and so on and so forth. Brothers, you don't understand how much of a na'mah, of a blessing there is to be a Muslim. That you wake up as a Muslim. And inshallah, we die as a Muslim. And for me to be stabbed, and for me to be here, and I'm trying to show you brothers to learn from my mistakes. There's many things I want to say, but I don't want to be too detailed because this is the first visit. But I'm going to tell you the detailed crime, crimes, and things that we used to do. And wallahi, we never used to get pleasure from it. And on top of that, do you know what? I got kidnapped. After I got stabbed, Six months later, I got kidnapped. And then the kidnapping was so severe. And what they done to me is the torture they put me through and the bleach they forced me to, they forced me, they forced me to drink and the petrol they forced me to feed and other substance till today, I don't know what it was. They tortured me badly. To the level, to the level I had to have another surgery. And when I had another surgery, they removed two thirds of my bowel. You see, this, this table is about 1.5 meters. So imagine another table. And they removed about two-thirds of my bowels, so about this much. And this is what I got left. And some people are like, how do you still cope with yourself? And there's something that I say to them. I say to them that I can eat as much as I can, as much as I can, and I can never get fat. Because two-thirds of my bowels has been removed. 
So you always have to look at the good side of life and what Allah gives you. But what got to me after the kidnapping, and I'm going to finish up on this inshallah, yeah? Is that I got told I can never have kids. Because of how the person stabbed me and what they done to me in torturing, is they told me I can never have kids. And that killed me, man. I feel like I'm a man that needed to have a child of my own. Have a little mini aim and running around. And I've always wanted a daughter as my first child. I've always wanted a daughter. You know, a son, but no, I wanted a daughter. And then I got told I can never have kids. So I was really beating myself up. I was very depressed. I was very, like I lost hope. And then I met a woman that had a child. And I got married to that woman that had a child. She was six years older than me. She's a divorcee. She was from a different culture than I am. And she had a child. So I said to myself, you know what? This is a sign from Allah. Allah brought me this woman into my life because she knows I can't have any kids. So therefore, Allah gave me a woman with a child so I could take care of this child or try to take care of this child like he's my own. And subhanAllah, there was a time I was speaking to my teacher. My teacher said to me, Amen. I know there's something that you want very badly. And I said, I do, because every time I wanted to speak about my own kids, subhanAllah, I get emotional. He said to me, Amen, give in charity. But I do a lot of charity, that like physically I do a lot. He goes, no, Amen. Give in charity. Because the Prophet Muhammad said, give even if it's half a day. I said, say no more. I went to the bank. I told to the person, I told to the woman out behind the cashier, I said, give me everything in my bank. I want every single penny out of my bank without telling me how much it is. The hadith says, you should give money with your right, that not, that not even your left hand knows or has knowledge of it. So I said to the woman, give me everything in my bank account, put it in the envelope, let me sign for it. I went straight to the master that gave it, Fisa Billah. It could be five million check, I don't know. I wish I never had that. Or it could be five pounds with a few pennies. But I gave everything away. A month later, a month later, my wife gives me a gift. I'm like, yeah, mashallah, she's giving me a watch or something. You get me? It's like a little package like this. It's quite long. I was very excited. And then in that package, it was my wife's pregnancy test. I got told I could never have kids. I lost hope in Allah. You see, I gave up on Allah, man. Through the suffering and the pain and the torture that I went through of getting kidnapped, being stabbed on two occasions, I lost it. Mentally, I'm not there till today. Mentally, I'm still not there because I'm still suffering through some of the traumas. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, brothers, man. Some of the traumas that you go through on the street life, it follows you throughout your whole life. And sometimes you don't know how to deal with it. So even counseling or therapy doesn't help. Do you understand where I'm coming from? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with a daughter. She's just turned four years old. You see? You gave up on yourself. I gave up on myself. But Allah has the best of plans. Allah knew when to give me a child. I tried for a child for three years. And I didn't get nowhere. Then Allah gave me a child at the moment where I was at my deepest depression. And Allah gave me that child. The same Allah that split the ocean for Musa alayhi salam could be this would be the same Allah that would do miracles like that for you, your family, and every single person you know. Because bear in mind, just because they were prophets and Allah did those miracles for them, you got to remember before they were prophets, they were who? Humans. We're humans too. My miracle of me being told I can never have a child, I compare that to the miracle of Musa alayhi salam. Why? Because this is my day and age. This is my miracle. And every single day that your soul Ask permission from Allah to wake up. In order for us to make a difference, in order to us to repent and get closer to Allah. So use your time. Why is he my brother, my dear respected brothers and sisters? Stuff I said sisters, no sisters here, yeah. 
Yeah, on this is subhanahu wa even though. But this is this is the reality of it. So make a difference. And you know all of these people that you see around you. I'm talking about the brothers that organize it and the uncles and the imams. Wallahi, we should give credit to them because they come away from their mothers, their wives, their kids. For them to come to the masjid in order for them to make time for you. You think the sheikh and the and the brothers in the back that organize this, do you think they don't want to be here? Because of course they do. They want to be here because they want to make a difference within the youth. You man are the next future. You lot are the people that I wanna that I want to lead the masjid, to lead the salah, to be an imam, or to be an engineer, or something, something good of your life, or a doctor. So we could pray behind you one day, inshallah. Don't think. That's any of us that are wearing thobs, wallahi, that we're better than you, or we're, we're out here giving talks to you, thinking, you know what, these brothers coming to us. Marshal, I remember going to some of the talks, Marshal, there's brothers nudging each other, thinking, yeah, my man's sitting up there, thinking, man, he's better than us. Actually, I'm the biggest comeback. I'm the biggest low life. I'm the biggest waste man. I say it loudly. I say it proudly as well. Because I'm not the best of her fathers to my stepson. I'm not the best father to my daughter or to my wife, to like a husband to her. I'm not the best of child to my mother and father that are still alive. I'm not the best of servants to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't, I don't worship Allah the way he deserves to be worshipped. I still have my flaws. I still have my faults. But I'm trying. And brothers are trying to be someone like how we used to be. If you want to live that lifestyle of being a bad boy or a gangster, I'm going to say this to the sheikh as well. He should recommend it for you, brothers. Go and be a bad boy on one condition. On one condition. You go and live that lifestyle when your mother and father return back to Allah. Because it is unfair for them to either worry about you or stress about you while you're either in prison or six foot under. East London has become a graveyard for brothers killing brothers. Why? For a name, for ratings. Brothers are carrying a knife that don't even have problems for goodness sake. Who there? Akhi, what jinns are you fighting, Akhi? <laughs> Big man tin. Who are you fighting, bro? You ain't even got problems. Man's walking around like, nah, bro, I'm bringing a knife into school because I want the man them to say to me, yo, my, my, yo, my guy, still, yo, my guy. Ra, bro. What do you think your mother wouldn't know that that knife is missing or something? Come on, Akhis, man. And sisters that are listening, don't let none of these brothers sell you a dream of that you're going to get married to them. Fear Allah. Focus on your Islam. And for the brothers that are taking advantage of these sisters by trying to do... Akhi, it's going to come back to you, my brother. If it's not you, then definitely to your daughter. Imagine your daughter being oppressed being taken advantage of and even doing stuff with them because you used to do things back in your day so don't be angry that's coming back to you now have to work on Allah and think well of Allah Jalla wa Allah. so Jazakallah khair for the community for inviting me Alhamdulillah I'm going to stay for some time anyway for brothers that only have questions and so on and so forth and subhanallah I've actually got the kidnapping video on my phone. So if there was a projector or TV, I would have showed you. I'm going to show brothers because I'm here. And the kidnapping video shows me being kidnapped and torturing me. And they went to the level of burning me. They went to the level of um, ripping the bag of my stomach. And also, and also, they had me naked while torturing me tied up to a chair. But obviously this is something I'm not going to show you brothers because it's quite graphic. But I'm just going to show you the moment they hit me with a baseball back in the back of my head. I'm unconscious and I'm being dragged. This is the reality of this bad boy lifestyle, man. I thought I was untouchable and Allah humbled me by making me go to prison. Then when I came out of prison, Allah tested me to see if I was going to go back to my sick and twisted ways. But I kept firm. The same guy that stabbed me or got the someone to stab me, now he's doing life in jail. Allah dealt with him. His life is ruined. You don't want to ruin two families, man. The moment you stab or kill someone, 
you've ruined your own family and you've ruined theirs. So remember that, my dear respected brothers and sisters. I love you all for the sake of Allah. Jazakallah khairan for your time. And inshallah, in the Sheikh wants to come. I don't know if any of you have cute, like questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Jazakallah khairan. Barakallah khairan. Shukran. Jazakallah khairan. The Masiha and sharing his stories with us. Because some of some of the aspects of the story are very personal. And you have to be brave enough to share that as well. It's not just... You know, you can't just stand up and say things. And the whole purpose of this is that we take a learning from it. it, it, it this is not entertainment. It is reality. Mm. And it has happened to Brother Ayman. And I know, personally, it has happened to other people. Mm. I personally know it has happened to other people. I'll just share a very short, very simple story. In Bristol, I just came from Bristol today. I've got um, my, my auntie, my fufu living there. So one of my relatives drifted away into wrong lifestyle. His friend got kidnapped from shopping mall, broad daylight, got kidnapped. Just like his drugs, dealings, money, owed. They just came and kidnapped him, broad daylight from a shopping, shopping center, right in front of a shopping center. Got in there, punched him, hit him, pushed him into the car. They tied him up his hand and they're talking all big. We're going to take you, we're going to kill you, we're going to burn you, we're going to drown you, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And they kept on speaking all the way through. The color of the people is not important. I don't want to say blood. No, right? of course, of course. It, it's the characters. And it was his own car. They, they beat him up, put him in his own car, and they're saying all of this. This happened in real life in this room. And these two individuals were notorious. They were well known for these kind of activities. He had a silence in his car. As soon as they stopped the car, they went out, he bent down, picked up the silencer, he was loaded, he emptied entire clip. clip on both of them. They were dead on this spot. He got caught. My relative helped them hide the weapon. He got five years, uh, eight years straight. Eight years straight for nothing, just, just hiding the weapon. Right? He was not part of any of these. He's part of them in a different way, but in this incident, he didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So eight years of life is gone. He, his son grew up while he's in prison, okay? His wife had to manage everything. Family was, we were all shattered. Um, and the other boy got life imprisonment. Mm. And, and uh, the, the, the two individual, other two individuals died. They died on the scene, on the spot. They died literally within a minute they died because he just emptied everything that he yeah. had. So this is real and we have to remember every actions that we do have consequences. 100%. That's what you have to remember. In this world and in the hereafter. Mm. So what the brother was telling us, everything that he did had consequences. Some of them directly immediately comes back to you, others come back later. They don't go away. That's just pure fact of life. And in the hereafter, you have to be answerable. Mm. So we don't want to go into detail. These things happen, and it has happened to many, many brothers and sisters. So if you brothers have any questions, inshallah, we'll take some questions. Food is upstairs ready, so we don't want to take too long. Sure, so no. we'll go upstairs. But if you've got questions, yeah. we'll take about three, four questions. Brother over there. I was going to ask um, the brother there to explain to the younger brothers, like, you see the routine of prison, how it is. No, you can take the question directly. Um, to be honest, with the prison life, yeah, you're basically you have 23 hours and a half a day. So you only come up exercise. If you don't have, if you don't go to education, two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. That's it. Some of them get to put their, you get to put your name down to go gym. It doesn't necessarily mean you will go to gym. You would think, oh, Masha, some brothers are coming out bold or not bold. The man, they're just doing cell workouts and not going to the gym and so on and so forth. But it is very, very hideous. The fact that you have a guy walking around with a key at your house, your boss. Your friend. You can hear mice. Uh, like it's, it's crazy. Sometimes, like the cell, 
the cell of how flat is here. This is it. So this is basically your soul. You go like your bed. Sometimes the qibla is directly towards the right. toilet. So you're praying towards where you basically take a dump. Like this is the reality of it. And then, uh, you can't do nothing about it because you don't want to miss your salah. At the same time, you're basically facing the toilet. And it doesn't have no toilet seats, you know, for health and safety reasons. It's just the toilet. And this is the reality of prison. And some prisons, some prisons, you have to press the bell and you go on a waiting list to go and use a toilet outside of your soul. If not, they give you a bucket and you have to basically do your dump in the bucket. And then in the morning, so you're going to be sleeping in your own smell of poo. And in the morning, when they open your cell door to go for exercise, still like this, still today, some, some prisons, you have to go and put the bucket out into an actual toilet. This is the reality. You don't get to choose what prison you go to. And this is what the brother probably has heard stories or know. Prison lifestyle is a very disgusting lifestyle. Hygienic, everything like your hygiene, everything goes downhill. So what the brother's trying to Allah Alhamdulillah, he mentioned that. Because and at the same time, the fact that when you go back to cell after visit, you feel so low, so depressed. But the people that just visited you go back to their normal lifestyle and so on and so forth. And this is the reality. So imagine that. Would you really want someone to go back and forward and opening your cell door, closing your cell door and telling you when you can eat and not eat? This is the reality of it. And imagine this for life now. Stop off over that question. Anything else? Yes, bro. I can't on this. Bro. Question, what are the no, no, basically, the what are the consequences of someone that actually is carrying a knife and he doesn't know? Subhanallah. Actually, I'm going to be honest with you, bro. Everyone that carries a knife is a waste man in the eyes of us and in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Actually, we're not on the battlefield, bro. Like I said, who, who are you beefing? But they're carrying a knife as, as big as this, Akhi, and, and you could tell from the way they're walking. Like you could tell it's going down their legs. Like what's the Akhi? Who what what zombie ap apocalypse is are you, are you fighting Akhi? Who, what what Rambo are you trying to defeat Akhi? Allahumma barik, mashaAllah. And these are the same brothers that are crumbling at home. So for the brothers that are carrying a knife, obviously there's a reason. Some brothers carry it. Sorry, my mouth feel like I feel like I'm gonna sneeze, man. But subhanAllah, there's some brothers that are carrying a knife for no reason. Like they ain't got problems, but they're like, you know what, just in case the problem comes, Akhi, shaitan will get into your head. I know innocent brothers that have stabbed and killed people that have had no problems. Why? Because there's a guy that tries to come and rob their phone or this and that, and then they take out a knife, and while he's running away, he stabbed them like this, and now you're doing life in jail, bro. And what are you going to say to the judge? I didn't mean to do it. Bro, you walked out of your house with a knife. And for you to take a life, Akhi, the consequences in front of Allah, Akhi, you've killed a life, Akhi. You're not Malik al Mot. You're not the angel of death. Do you think you could take matters into your own hands and say, you know what? Stuff lies in one Allah, bro. I'm your Lord today. So today you die upon what I say. And if I allow you, then I allow you to remain alive. No, boy, it don't work like that. So I hope brothers that are carrying a knife, or if you know someone that's carrying a knife, or that's putting that lifestyle, I'll tell them to hold it back. You don't need to. We have Allah. You see, this is what people are forgetting. We actually have Allah. Allah gives, gives permission for your soul to wake up every single morning to get closer to Him, to repent, to be on the straight path. But now brothers want to take matters in their own hands and say, yeah, brother. Today, today I'm her Achilles, bro. Now, I don't work like that Islamically, my bro. And don't think to yourself that if you are a drug dealer and if you are someone that carries a knife from going around stabbing people, okay, do not, and I say this, but do not gamble with Allah. Thinking, you know what, I'm going to do all of these sins, but when I'm ready to change and repent and be a good guy and stop rapping 
and stop stabbing people and especially stop selling drugs. When I'm ready, I'm gonna do this. That's gambling with Allah. Because you're going, you you think that Allah is going to allow you to get that stage on your terms? A'udhu billah. Anything else? Brothers, don't be shy. Yeah, brothers, don't be shy. Yeah, brothers, I know, no, so I, I can see in their eyes, uh, Sheikh, man, they're hungry brothers right here, inshallah. Allahumma barik. Jazakallah khair, brothers, if you've got any questions, we can have it upstairs, inshallah. And I just got want to say, your masjid is beautiful. Allahumma barik. Sheikh, so when can we play football? Inshallah, I'm joking. Hayakallah. I don't know how this works, bro. You might come for food. Yeah. <laughs>